Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, we are holding currently our second session um, in terms of uh, our conference day here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Some of you may be rejoining us. We did have some microphone um, glitching in our first session. And so to that point, I want to welcome uh, Dr. Santiago with her cam. Her voice is working. Could you give us a test test? Hola. Hola. Yes. <laughs> OK. OK. Um, welcome. Welcome, everyone, to the Community Voices session, uh, Women's Emotional Wellness, a focus on the needs and barriers for his Hispanic and Latinx women in Delaware. My name is Andy Kerr. I'm a psychiatric uh, mental health nurse practitioner in Delaware, and I'll be facilitating the discussion today. Um, going back and forth a little bit on my computer to move the screen here. So let me see. Okay, there I am. Um, and uh, representing, I believe I said, Christiana Care Center for Women's Emotional Wellness today. I would like to welcome uh, Adriana Vivera Sosa, our um, esteemed community health worker and program coordinator to speak uh, today and to lead us off on this very important conversation. Adriana? Yeah, good afternoon. I hope everyone had a really good lunch. Um, I did recognize a lot of names. Welcome, welcome. So once again, for the people do, that do not know me, uh, my name is Adriana Rivera Sosa. I am the program coordinator for the Health Ambassador Program at Christiana Care, where we assist caregivers um, who have kids under the age of five, and we focus in helping them in through um, eliminating barriers through social determinants of health. Um, I'm also the co-chair for the Wilmington Consortium too as well. I am also um, a full-time mom of four kids and also um, a little bit snapshot of my person itself. I am originally from Mexico. I was born in a little place called Jalapa, Veracruz, right on the coast. I am also a DACA recipient. I think it's important for everyone to know I'm really transparent about my legal status and also an advocate for the community that I'm serving on. So we're gonna get started with the first picture. Um, the first picture really resonates to me because mental health is a Latino issue too as well. Um, in just all of the barriers and the potluck that we currently have, um, the thing that really resonates with me is that the language barrier. Only 5% in the United States of licensed therapists are able to provide their services in Spanish. 20% um, of Latinos or Latino moms, Hispanic moms, do not have health insurance. Um, culture differences. 7% um, of the licensed psychologists only identify as Latino. And then, of course, the stigma, as you know, within Latinx community, there's a variety of stigmas among mental health. Um, so in order to break down the mental health barriers, we just want to make sure that we educate the community and really recognize what is mental health and tell them um, instead of saying, oh, you're going to go and see a psychologist, um, then you're estás loca. No, you're not crazy. It's okay to not be okay. Está bien, no estar bien. Um, and then reach out for help overall and really recognize where are the red flags for mental health and really understand what is mental health because in the past, I used to tell them, well, then I don't feel okay, then you, they will tell you, well, pray about it or go to your prison or just, it will go away. So make sure that recognize and educate moms that they are on the verge or at risk one year postpartum to still have postpartum depression. Um, within my role in Christiana Care as the health ambassador, um, we encounter a mom who was in her third trimester expecting. Um, she discovered that the baby had a medical condition. Um, through the medical condition, they really did not give them any hope of surviving. Um, the mom at the same time was facing through domestic violence. Um, the baby did not survive. Um, during the time of the baby that was given birth, they really did not have anyone who could provide her any Griffman support, Brigman support. Um, she was also placed into a waiting list to receive mental health 
help overall. After the waiting list and her name was called, she was seen by a therapist who did not speak the language and um, came from a different background and different culture. So overall, all of those barriers and those components really did not help her situation because she had many distressors in her own life with domestic violence. And then also she was dealing with the treatment of her baby passing away. So I just want to be, be bring awareness to what's going on in Delaware within all the maternal health, that there's not enough services in the state of Delaware that are providing services. Currently, in, we have some scale partners. I know we talked about barriers among not health insurance. So currently in Newcastle County, the place that I'm serving, we have Westside, we have a Manasseh counselor, and we have recently Tomorrow's Change, um, who are serving the Latin's community service and also are able to provide culture, humanity to those um, community members overall. Um, and once again, I'm just here to bring awareness and really try to provide more resources that perhaps we might have in the state of Delaware. But then now I would like to open the floor to my colleague, um, Dr. Lourdes. Lourdes, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you, Adriana. Hi, my name is Dr. Lourdes Santiago. I am a Boricua, um, born and raised in Puerto Rico and with a heart with um, wanting to help the uh, Latino and Latinx population here in the United States. So I did my internship here in uh, Massachusetts and, and then afterwards um, I was brought here by for different reasons in the beautiful state of Delaware. And um, I was, I guess, blessed by uh, being reached by Adriana Viveros and having the experience of being able to help the Hispanic and Latinx uh, community, um, especially uh, the mothers and mothers-to-be. Um, basically, one of the things that um, I would like to share is just to confirm what research has basically uh, presented uh, that you know just confirms what Adriana and what Dr. Uh, Ada Gonzalez is going to be sharing after, uh, after me. So the prevalence of perinatal mental health disorders in Latina women, um, it's interesting because for Latina women, there is a higher risk uh, for perinatal depression. Um, and we already know that in terms of perinatal depression, it's already one in seven women. So knowing that for Latinas is 37% more likely to experience that in comparison to all other racial groups is something that we really need to be aware of. And then there's also perinatal anxiety, which is um, one of the perinatal mental health disorders that, you know, has not been mentioned a lot. It sort of like is uh, in the back burner um, because we talk a lot about postpartum depression, but anxiety does come um, as well with perinatal um, and postpartum. So it's 13 to 21 in new gestational and non-gestational parents. So we just wanna make uh, aware of that. Also, uh, we wanna represent the Latinx community that also wants to be part of birthing and uh, parenting um, infants. So some of the risk factors for developing perinatal mental health disorders, and this is for a general, um, for all racial groups, is like a history of mental health disorder or, or family uh, history of mental health disorder, um, being ex experienced at first childhood, um, experiencing an unplanned or an unwanted pregnancy, complications during pregnancy, or delivery and relationship issues and stress and social and environmental factors and experiencing parenthood um, during adolescence. So in addition to that, there are other um, barriers and risks that Latina and Latinx uh, can encounter. And 
One of the major ones is cultural values like familialism or familialism and marianismo. And uh, Dr. Aragonza is going to share a little bit of her experiences while working with the with this population and how cultural values could be, you know, sort of a barrier um, seeking and receiving treatment. And then there's stigma about mental health, which is something that Diana mentioned prior to, and then of course, perimental health disorders. So lack of access to care and support from others, and obviously language barriers. So I want to share a little bit about my uh, professional and personal experience um, with um, perinatal mental health disorders. I am a mother of a five-year-old son and a seven-month-old daughter. Um, and after two months of giving birth, I started feeling depressed at times and anxious. So I thought I was just having the baby blues and I just decided to wait it out, you know. Um, and six months post, you know, later, and I was experiencing like constant changes in mood and severe anxiety, um, like never before. And having the knowledge that I have in the background, I know that nope, this is not the baby blues. This is post postpartum. This is a perimental health disorder that I have. So I was able to connect with the right help, get the right support. My family um, learned about it and helped me uh, through it as well. And it opened the door for me to be able to say yes to having another baby and uh, with my seven month old daughter having less distress than what I did with when my five year old son was, uh, was a baby. So my professional experience, uh, my personal experience and my professional experience, I have been able to work with uh, Hispanic women and, and Latinas uh, with her mental health disorder and their families as well, like their spouses um, or their partners. And, um, and the use of, of some of the therapy um, that I've been able to be, that's been helpful is evidence-based uh, for the most part CBT and um, there's other variants to it, but I will let um, my colleague, Dr. Ada Gonzalez, uh, share her experience with treatment with this population. Thank you, Dr. Lourdes, and I am Dr. Ada Gonzalez, and uh, I'm from, as I say, here, there, and everywhere because I was born in Cuba, left when I was 18 through Spain, spent there several months. I have lived many years in Costa Rica, in Mexico, in Germany, in the United States, in Michigan and Texas, which are like two different republics. and. Working in uh, universities, part of that time, uh, I was exposed to Latinos from all Latin America, really. So I understand the differences, sometimes subtle, between the different Latino populations. Um, and that's something that not everybody understands. But kind of going uh, ahead with uh, something that Dr. Lourdes had said about anxiety before um, before uh, the baby is born. A big part of that in my experience working with Latino young women that are pregnant is as soon as the community knows they are pregnant, everybody comes out of the woodworks with all these horror stories about what happened with their childbirth or their comadre childbirth or or their sister childbirth and it always ends badly you know someone dies the baby dies the mom is in labor for forever two days and and meanwhile the young impressionable mothers get more and more terrified they become more and more anxious. So having someone from outside that they can respect as a as an expert, uh, being able to tell them, uh, no, no, wait, it's, it's not really, that's a small percentage that might have issues, but almost every woman uh, has an easier time. And hey, 
those hips that you complain about because you cannot be as thin as your <laughs> American counterparts, they are going to help you have an easier birth. Uh, <laughs> so as a marriage and family therapist working uh, for more than 30 years, and I would say of those 30 years, at least 20 have been with basically Latino population mostly, um, I understand those issues and also, you know, people say, well, so which uh, modalities of treatment help best with Latino populations? Well, unfortunately, we don't have as much research to see what works best for Latino women. We have a lot of evidence-based modalities for the general population, you know, like uh, cognitive behavioral or structural family therapy or emotional uh, therapies that have been shown to be helpful. But when it comes to Hispanic populations, we really don't have anything that says, yes, that is helpful or not. And so you need to use your or your own judgment and whatever the client comes in with in order to be able to reach into your toolbox and see what will fit this particular client the best because not everything works for everybody. Yet, above everything, both on the research and in my experience with clients, is the connection that you as a therapist make with the client what trumps everything else. If you can make a strong connection with the client, it almost doesn't matter which therapy you use, it will be successful. I have so many clients that say, oh, I'm so glad I have you because you are the only person I can really talk to about everything I think without them telling me that I am crazy or that I am just nervous and I, you know, that I will get over it or that uh, as a mother, I should know by instinct what is going to be okay for my baby, except that then on their next breath, they tell me that I am doing everything wrong. And so then being able to, to have reassurance that no, they are not doing everything wrong, that they are doing a lot of the right things. And then maybe some suggestions here and there of what they can do different is, is very helpful. And then encouraging them if they have, for example, postpartum depression, to go and get medication. That's such a problem in the Latino community because almost everybody doesn't want medication because they say only crazy people need medication. Or they want to try it before, so they go to a friend that is having medication for depression and ask for a couple of pills to see if it works for them. Well, of course, it's not going to work for them because the dosage and you need two, three weeks before you know if it is helping or not helping. So um, encouraging them to understand that just like if you have any other physical problem, this can be a physical problem too in your brain, a, a, a lack of equilibrium in your chemistry in your brain, and therefore you do need medication. That is helpful too, because almost everybody else in their own community is discouraging them from getting medication. So, you know, being, being conscious of those things is really, really important so that you can be the best help that you can for these uh, ladies. And, and the other part is really understanding that more than where they are from, what weights the most is where they are in the acculturation process. Mm -hmm. How long have they been in the United States? How much English they speak or not? Can they drive or not? Who, who makes the money in the family? Uh, you know, those kind of things are and encouraging them to learn more English, to learn to drive, to, to be able to become a bit more independent because many times their own husbands wants to keep them isolated because it gives them more power over them. Mm -hmm. And then they are afraid of, of doing something that they will not like, of course. Uh, so, you know, normalizing some of those things and being help, being able to encourage them to become a bit more independent within the community, because you cannot isolate them from the community. 
otherwise they will lose that support. And that's one of the problems we had over when COVID hit, because being so family oriented and community oriented, when you had all those women isolated from the rest of the community, it was even worse. So <clears throat> it's a big responsibility, I feel, for all of us to encourage those women in the community. And even, you know, sometimes if you can bring in together with the client, the mother and the comadre and the nana and, and other people from the community, uh, so that they can understand and they can support this young uh, mom, that's even better. So those are my two cents. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. And, and as a prescriber, I appreciate you sharing that wisdom in terms of the fear of medicine, um, maybe the lack of understanding of how it works and what it's doing in the brain being a equally important part of of my uh, role as a prescriber um, is educating as well as deeply listening and connecting is that educational piece that maybe is is missing. So yeah. thank you. That's a huge um, point to make. We are at 10 minutes, which means we would like to start to um, offer discussion uh, of our community here present. We're wondering um, if anyone is wanting to share. So I'm going to start by uh, adding in Cynthia. Let's see if we can get this to work this time. Um, Cynthia, I have added you to the conversation. Um, I think uh, Tanea as well as Keisha. Let's see if people start to pop up on our screens. If you can unmute yourself, we would love to hear more community voice uh, in this discussion of barriers to care. Do you see an opportunity to unmute yourself? We can also use the chat function to put in your comment, but was definitely hoping to get this to function in terms of moderating and hearing your voice. Um, While we hear from them, <laughs> Uh, maybe just uh, uh, one short comment from me, another comment, is that um, if this is a first baby or a second baby or a third baby, also makes a difference for Hispanic woman. And, and if all her babies are with her, all her children, because sometimes with immigration, we have women that are having a baby here, but they have... They had to leave a four or five year old in their country of origin with a, with a grandma, for example. And then having the new baby brings them into depression because they start missing even more the one that is not with them. So, you know, keeping all those things in mind is important. Yes. Um... I can say I think also just not having the family here is is a challenge. One thing I recognized, though, was I was able with telehealth to meet more of the family than I think I ever was before, thanks to COVID. I don't know that we have a lot more thanks to COVID to, to, to say, because uh, it definitely created a lot of strain as well in all communities, women, perinatal women, uh, in terms of isolation and less community. But I, I found uh, Dr. Gonzalez by using uh, telehealth, I was able to actually meet partner, see other children uh, present in session and learn more about um, how the home functions and maybe what supports were there um, to remind her that she has and uh, to use them, like we said, to speak mm -hmm. up and ask for the help. Good point. And I think also uh, what a little bit of what um, we shared in the previous uh, breakout session was having opportunities uh, for La Latina and Latinx to th those that are mothers to be your parents to be and um, and that they are uh, to be able to uh, get together and share their experiences. Um, and I know for a fact that um, Adriana Viveros has been able to uh, 
promote those forums and also within Westside Family Health, uh, which it was also mentioned, um, has been those services and those opportunities have been also for the Latina and the Latinx population. Oh, Laura seems to be on. Welcome, Laura. Oh, welcome. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. yes. We welcome your voice. Yeah, my name is Laura Sturmel, and I work for the Office of Emergency Preparedness here at the Division of Public Health for the state of Delaware. Um, thank you for coming together to talk about this community. One of my roles is um, access and functional needs. So within that subgroup, we have um, people with disabilities, people with low English proficiency, also it's expectant mothers. So the Hispanic his expectant mother community is kind of the intersection of, of, of a bunch of access and functional needs. And I guess what my question is, and it's kind of specific, but see if you have any feedback. The best way to kind of get started in reaching that community to talk about expectant mothers being prepared for emergencies. And if they were to end up in mass care and a shelter situation, you know, what, what is the best way to start that? So really understanding behind the scene what's happening, because sometimes we come and address different needs and we have our own agenda, mm -hmm. but we really do not understand what the primary necessity is for that community member. And then also being able to communicate because a lot of those families do not want to save their legal status. And in case of an emergency, they don't want to come to a shelter because they do think that perhaps ICE might show up. So building that rapport with them and let them, let them know that you're here to help and then you're here to empower them and whatever else that is that need is, I think that will be the first step. Really understanding what their priority does is because really being able to meet patients where they are or community members, because sometimes it's really difficult because coming from me as a DACA recipient, my agenda is completely different to my coworkers um, because you're always on that unknown of what potentially could happen tomorrow. So that fly and fly instance always with you. So really being able to understand what their agenda is or what their priorities are. Thank you, Adriana. I see we have Alexandra. Um, let's see if you're able to unmute and join this community conversation on barriers to care. I'm here to provide support and doing not such a good job of providing the video support, but I was just trying to um, add a few folks who were providing comments. So um, I see that there's some great comments that are uh, that are yes. coming in. Thank you so much for your help. Thank you. So, so yeah, um, I don't know how many more minutes we have. We have three minutes. Awesome. So we have Carrie Burton. Um, she wrote in the chat, I'm working with a mom and a family who was resistant to work with me. And I did a get through to her and she's dealing with depression and think she is um and she thought that she was not a good mom so the language barrier is there but using the interpreter has helped in sending uh also lots of material in spanish has helped and she is receiving uh therapy and this is helpful uh yes definitely carrie um thank you for helping out that uh latino mother and uh, using interpreter services um, is is good, um, and also uh, providing access to material um, in Spanish is is also uh, very helpful. And um, that would be the next step if there is not the possibility of referring to a Spanish speaking therapist. Um, then. Obviously, being ha having an interpreter and being able to provide those materials in Spanish. I think one of the things that, like you mentioned in the beginning, it was hard, but you kept through. You demonstrated uh, that you were humble in helping her. Um, and I think that's what might have opened the door for her to keep uh, in therapy. So kudos to you, Carrie, for that. Thank you. And... We also have Jacinta. Um, 
This is, she put that my experience has made me realize that understanding the unique situations created by the immigration experience helps me with caring for this population. And definitely uh, that's sort of like the same uh, experience uh, most probably as Adriana, I cannot speak for that, but trying to be cultural humble, I do understand um, that that is something that is very helpful for you in uh, getting connected with uh, some of the Latino and Latinx population. And so thank you for sharing. Another thing I will share is that I do understand in our different roles, we have certain criteria or certain data to report, but it's how we ask those questions is the big thing that makes the difference. Um, you will have an agenda, you will have certain things that you need to ask, but don't sound so robotic and say like, question number one, question number two, be able to build that rapport because you're being, you're asking them to come into their intimacy, things that they're not telling other people. But then if you're also not sharing with them and providing some feedback or some kind, then you're not going to be able to build that rapport because you're telling them to give you all the information about their personal life that they have never talked to them about. And you're not really giving them anything. Um, that to me, is sometimes it's the best way to build rapport. Make something relatable. It does not have to be really personal, but at the same time, we're all humans. Try to build that rapport in the human way, what's or all. Thank you. Over. Thank you to this beautiful panel, this very important conversation, all of your expertise we appreciate. And again, hoping to have more conversation in the future and to build on this very beginning of a community conversation on barriers to treatment for Hispanic and Latinx women. Uh, thank you everyone for joining your comments. Send us, uh, continue to add in comments, you know, uh, articles that you feel are helpful to share, resources in the community that perhaps we did not mention because we're trying to build that information as well as where the resources are for our women in Delaware. Thank you so much to everyone and I'll see you back in the main area. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Bye-bye.